Welcome to the Foundations of Astronomical Data Science Instructor Onboarding. My name is Osley Bostrom, and I am one of the developers of this curriculum. Its development was funded by the American Institute of Physics Venture Partnership Grant in collaboration with the American Astronomical Society and the Carpentries. It is a data carpentry curriculum. My area of research is studying exploding stars, also known as supernovae. And one of my motivations for creating this lesson can be demonstrated by this plot. Here I'm showing the number of hydrogen-rich supernovae discovered each year as hatched rectangles. You can see that the number discovered is slowly increasing. But starting in 2023, the supernovae discovered by the Rubin Observatory's Legacy Survey of Space and Time will completely dwarf our current findings. My field is rapidly moving away from data reduction of individual images on personal computers and into a world of databases and alert streams. This happens to all, all astronomical data sets, observational and simulated, as the size of the data increases. This curriculum is intended to prepare the astronomical community for this shift in analysis methods using computational tools and best practices, as well as giving learners skills that can be transferred out of astronomy. This lesson is intended for astronomers at any career stage. We assume that our learners have an undergraduate understanding of astronomy and the familiarity with the Python and Bash concepts that are taught in the software carpentry curriculum. It was incredibly challenging to create a two-day curriculum. There are too many tools to teach. On the right, I'm showing you a word cloud based on the results of a survey conducted at a AAS meeting about what tools astronomers would need in the next five to 10 years. Out of this cloud, we chose Python, AstroPy and AstroQuery, SQL in the form of ADQL, Pandas, and Matplotlib. With these tools, we hope to leave learners with the skills to develop and test SQL and Python, to work with remote databases and local storage, to validate data and analysis pipelines, and to create compelling visualizations of their results. Prior to arriving at the workshop, learners will have downloaded a zipped directory called Student Download as part of the setup. This directory includes files that are important both to the setup and to the workshop itself. The notebooks used for live coding during the workshop should be created in this directory. Therefore, at the beginning of the workshop, you should direct learners to navigate to this directory. The episode underscore functions.py file contains functions that learners will write throughout the workshop. This file enables them to import these functions at any time, allowing for a quick start at any episode. gd1 underscore isochrone.hdf5 is the isochrone file used in episode 7 to identify the main sequence of gd1. The az-paper-2call.mpl style is the matplotlib style file that is used in episode 8 as an example of creating a custom style. The environment.yml file is used in the setup to create a conda environment for the workshop, and the test underscore setup.ipynb notebook tests that the setup worked. Finally, the directory backup-data includes the files that learners will be writing throughout the workshop. These are not used in normal workshop operations, but can be used if a learner gets really behind or is unable to access the database. We will start with the scientific motivation of the data set that we will be using throughout the workshop. It is important that you start with this background when teaching a workshop. The entire curriculum culminates in the creation of figure one from the paper Off the Beaten Path, Gaia Reveals GD1 Stars Outside the Mainstream by Price Whelan and Banaka. Throughout the workshop, you will develop a series of more restrictive filters to identify the members of a globular cluster, which has been tidally stripped by the Milky Way and now forms a stellar stream, GD1, using data from the Gaia and PanStars surveys. In this series of pictures on this slide, you can see the process by which a gravitationally bound structure, such as a globular cluster or a dwarf galaxy, can be stretched into a stream by the gravitational potential of a massive central galaxy like the Milky Way. 
Here is figure one from Price, Whelan, and Banaka. In the top left panel, the proper motion of stars selected to be physically near the location of GD1 is shown and an anomalous cluster believed to be GD1 is highlighted in orange. Plotting the physical location of the highlighted stars in the upper right panel reveals the GD1 stream, although it is heavily contaminated by foreground and background stars. Using photometry from the PANSTAR survey, the lower left panel shows a color magnitude diagram of these stars and identifies the main sequence associated with the globular cluster that created GD1. This is highlighted in orange. In the lower right panel is a plot of the physical location of these stars. Most of the contaminating stars have been removed and the structure and substructure of GD1 can be seen. We chose this dataset for a number of reasons. It includes two large datasets, neither of which is feasible to download and search in its entirety. The science itself is compelling. With this analysis, the authors were able to extend the known length of GD1, identify detailed substructure within the stream, which could point to dark matter substructure, and identify the progenitor cluster. In addition to the interesting science, the identification of the stream is easy to visualize and does not require an advanced astronomical background. Finally, the paper was published one week after data release. This type of analysis can be developed ahead of time and then applied to a new data set for rapid results. It is easy to get lost in the details of this curriculum, both in terms of individual steps in the analysis and the specific use of tools to accomplish that step. It is therefore very important that throughout the lessons you frequently connect back to the big picture scientifically and in terms of the general skill set that you are teaching. We will summarize both of them here for each episode so that you get a sense of the overarching story before we dive into the details. In episode one, learners will develop a query to select a subset of Gaia data to prototype their filtering on. Here we are teaching learners how to query a remote database with SQL and ADQL using AstroQuery. In episode two, learners modify the output into a useful format and save the results. Here we are teaching learners to filter their data by location with AstroPy how to do coordinate transformations, and how to write the results to a FITS file. In episode three, the results are inspected, multiple tables are merged into a single more useful table, and the results are saved. In this episode, learners are introduced to AstroPy tables, pandas data frames, writing functions, and plotting in matplotlib. In episode four, additional filtering is defined to create a purer and smaller GD1 data set. This episode teaches learners about refining filters, creating a mask, and writing HDF5 files. Episode five is the first episode of the second day of the workshop. In this episode, learners add the filter developed locally in episode four to their SQL query and expand the physical region search to include most of GD1. This episode teaches them to expand their prototype to a larger data set and to write multi-extension HDF5 files. In episode six, the Gaia data is joined with the PanStars data to gather photometry for all stars selected thus far. This episode teaches learners to combine information from more than one table with SQL. In episode seven, the PANSTARS data is used to create an even more restrictive filter, which is applied to the downloaded data. Learners are taught to select and filter data with pandas. Finally, in episode eight, we use the files we have output and functions we have written throughout the workshop to create figure one from Price, Whelan, and Banaka. Here, we hope to fill in gaps in the learner's knowledge of matplotlib and streamline the creation of a publication quality figure. As you can see, this workshop covers a lot of intricate steps. It is essential that you come back to figure one from Price, Whelan, and Banaka frequently to touch base with what you have just done and where you will be going next. Additionally, as mentioned previously, make sure that you are also connecting the individual science case to the broader skill set being taught. 
Finally, you should talk through the scientific motivation for each step so that learners can see how they might arrive at a similar stage in their analysis. So now let's dive into the details of each episode. Day one covers episodes one through four. In episode one, you should introduce the scientific context of the curriculum and the data set. I like to mention that I think data sets are the future of astronomy. Feel free to ground this in your specific astronomical field. Make sure to mention that AstroQuery includes many catalogs other than Gaia, including Vizier, MAST, NED, and USNO. It is also important to point out that the ADQL syntax that we teach is almost entirely more general SQL and can therefore be applied in many contexts. Finally, in this workshop, learners will, de will develop the skills to create an analysis pipeline for quick and reproducible research. Episode one itself begins with a summary of how to navigate a Jupyter notebook. It then moves on to develop the skills to select and download data from the Gaia database by first making a connection to the Gaia server and exploring the database and tables, then writing a query and sending it to the server. Finally, the results are downloaded and the server's response viewed. At the bottom of this slide is the final command that is run. Here we are selecting ID, RA and DEC, proper motion in RA and DEC, parallax and error, and radial velocity from the Gaia source table in the Gaia DR2 database. We add the additional restrictions that the parallax should be less than one, meaning the star should be relatively far away, and that the BPRP color should be between negative 0.75 and 2 to exclude foreground stars and red M dwarfs. The best practices we hope to communicate in episode one are that you can use queries to select the data you need from a large data set, that you can learn about a data set both from the table metadata and the documentation, that queries should be developed incrementally, and that top and count can be used to test a query before it is run in full on the entire data set. Finally, capitalizing SQL keywords can make your code more readable, and it is a good practice to check the type of your output to make sure it is what you were expecting. Here are a few things to watch out for in episode one. There are two functions, load table and load tables, that are both described in the episode text and are easy to mistake for each other. Learners often confuse the methods launch job and launch job async. If only 2000 results are returned, it is likely that they used launch job when they meant to use launch job async. The AstroQuery interface doesn't provide useful error messages. This is why the incremental building and testing of queries is so important. And finally, in case it comes up, we query the parallax column, but don't actually use it for a few episodes. In episode two, we start trying to identify stars in GD1 by defining a rectangle around a small part of the stream. We don't have many filters in place, and so too many results would be returned if we queried the full physical size. Here, we prototype on a small portion of the data and then expand out our analysis once we've identified a few more ways to refine our data set. We will be working in two reference frames, the GD1 reference frame, which defines the phi1 axis along the direction of the stream and the phi2 axis perpendicular to the stream, and the International Coordinate Reference System, or ICRS, which defines the familiar right ascension and declination coordinates. The GD1 reference frame is useful for visualizing what we are selecting and identifying in the stream but this is very specific to GD1 and not useful for anyone else. For this reason, the Gaia catalog is in the more general ICRS coordinate system. The rectangle that we define in the GD1 reference frame around some stars in the GD1 stream is shown here in red. We then convert the vertices to a polygon in the ICRS frame and select stars inside this region from the Gaia catalog. The selected stars in the ICRS frame are shown in the upper right figure. In episode two, learners will be introduced to AstroPy quantity objects, which have units, and will use both the AstroPy units module and the AstroPy coordinates module. 
They will also use AstroPy reference frames to transform coordinates between the GD1 and the ICRS reference frames. This episode also teaches the ADQL commands polygon, contains, and point, and to write an AstroPy table to a FITS file. We hope that learners will apply these best practices to their research. Using quantity objects with units to catch errors, using the format function to compose complex flexible queries, developing queries incrementally, and saving data, including metadata, once a query is working. There are a few places that learners can get lost in this episode. The first is the complex syntax of contains. Here, each array and deck point is checked to see if it is in the defined circle, and contains returns a 1 if it is and a 0 if it is not. The where 1 equals contains statement then checks to see if the result of contains is 1, meaning the point is in the circle, or 0 if it is outside the circle. Additionally, the transformations are confusing. It really helps if learners understand why they are doing a transformation, so be sure to connect it to the physical world as much as possible. Finally, we are going to go back and repeat many of these steps on a larger data set, so it can be useful to emphasize the idea that we are prototyping a subset of the data which makes our queries run faster. Episode 3 takes the results of the query in ICRS coordinates and transforms them to GD1 coordinates. We create a spatial plot in both ICRS coordinates shown on the left and GD1 coordinates shown on the right to show that the region we selected while a simple rectangle in GD1 coordinates is not easy to define in ICRS coordinates. Additionally, we can see that the GD1 stream is not yet visible. We have too many stars contaminating our sample and therefore need to define a stricter selection criteria. The striping in these plots is a function of the scanning pattern that Gaia uses and does not affect our results. Finally, we combine the ICRS and GD1 coordinates into a single pandas data frame. This episode provides an introduction to plotting with matplotlib, data storage in AstroPy tables and pandas data frames, and how to convert between these two data types. It also allows us to put all of the code that we've spent the last three episodes developing into a relatively short function that we can call from here on out, avoiding typos and making bugs easier to fix. Finally, this episode introduces the HDF5 file structure, again saving our intermediate results for reproducibility. In addition to writing functions and saving results, this episode introduces the best practice of adjusting plotting parameters to avoid overplotting, and that the choice of AstroPy table and pandas data frame is subtle and can vary based on the user's needs. Learners can get hung up on the fact that we add a distance and radial velocity keyword to our coordinates. These are set to constants to avoid messing up future calculations. More details are given in the instructor guide. Additionally, the reflex correction doesn't add much to the general set of practices that we are teaching, but it is an important step for the rest of the analysis. In episode four, we will take a much tighter region around GD1 and use it to identify the proper motion of GD1, which is coherent and different from the background stars. On the left, you can see in red the region around GD1 that we previously selected in the GD1 reference frame, and in green is the narrow region that we are selecting within the red rectangle. This gives us a less complete but more pure sample of GD1 stars. We plot the proper motion of these stars in the upper right plot in the GD1 reference frame. Since these stars belong to a cluster that is being stretched into a stream, we expect them to only be moving along the stream in the phi 1 direction and to have very little proper motion in the phi 2 direction. The blue box shows an anomalous density and proper motion of stars that have high phi 1 proper motion and zero phi 2 proper motion, exactly as we'd expect for GD1. Now that we have identified cuts in proper motion space, we can expand our analysis to the full red rectangular region and apply this filter. Now when we plot the candidates in physical space, the GD1 stream is visible for the first time. This is shown in the lower right panel.
This episode introduces learners to techniques for inspecting and spot checking their data in Pandas, for filtering data frames, and for saving multiple data sets into an HDF5 file. The best practice that we hope they take away from this episode is to inspect basic statistics on their results to make sure that they are as expected. This is a complicated episode, and it's easy to get lost in what each data frame represents. Make sure that you are clear before teaching and that you repeat yourself often. Another thing to be aware of is that in previous episodes, we wrote a new HDF5 file. Here, we are adding to an already existing file, and you want to be sure that learners don't accidentally overwrite their previous results. This episode concludes day one. At the beginning of day two, you will want to have learners start a new notebook. You can follow the directions in the starting from this episode collapsible text at the beginning of episode five to make sure that you have all of the functions and data you need loaded. In episode four, we defined a filter for proper motion based on GD1 coordinates and applied this to our pandas data frame. As a reminder, this is shown in the upper right figure. In episode five, we will convert the vertices of this box to ICRS coordinates so that we can add it to our SQL query and apply this filter on the remote server rather than our local data. The stars we will select in ICRS proper motion are shown in green in the lower right plot. Additionally, since this cut significantly reduces the number of rows returned, we can expand our prototype to include more of the physical extent of GD1. The new region is shown in red in the figure on the left. Finally, once we have created and run a query for this larger region, selecting only stars with the expected proper motion of GD1, we will convert our results back to the GD1 reference frame and plot them. This episode demonstrates building more and more complex queries while at the same time reviewing many of the skills we have developed in previous episodes and taking advantage of the functions we have written. Additionally, it introduces the pandas series object. A key best practice that is shown in this episode is reducing the size of a retrieved data set on the server prior to downloading it. We did this first by developing a prototype on a subset of the data locally, and then expanding to the full data set when we had a well-developed set of filtering criteria. Additionally, we continue to emphasize saving incremental results. Because this episode repeats many of the steps we have already done on a larger data set, it can feel like we aren't doing anything new. Make sure to emphasize the idea of developing a prototype on a small data set and then applying it to a larger data set on a remote server. A benefit of the repetition in this episode is that it moves more quickly than previous episodes. However, this episode is one of the few places where we redefine variables. Be aware that phi1min, phi1max, phi2min, and phi2max are all redefined in this episode. Episode 6 is the culmination of our SQL lesson, having learners join three tables. Up until this point, we've been exclusively using the Gaia source table. In this episode, we will join to the PanStars1 best neighbor table, which links the Gaia source IDs to the PanStars IDs, which in this table is the original EXT source ID column. This table is then joined to the PanStars1 original valid table, which gives GRIZ and Y band photometry for each original EXT source ID. Here, the original EXT source ID column in the PanStars1 best neighbor table is matched to the obj ID in the PanStars1 original valid table. In this way, we get PanStars photometry and Gaia location and proper motion information for every source in our current GD1 catalog. Finally, we explore the data and write it to an HDF5 file. The big skill in this episode is using joins to combine information in multiple tables. The basic format shown in the lower right-hand side of the screen of join tables on keys can be applied to any SQL flavored database. 
Additionally, this episode reviews some of the data quality checks that we learned in Pandas and gives learners more experience with HDF5 files and some of the pitfalls of CSV files. By the end of this episode, learners will be asked to develop a long and sophisticated query. Developing this is an opportunity to emphasize the importance of incrementally developing and testing queries. Additionally, we can run data quality checks on the results to make sure they are what we expected. This episode uses a head function that we import from the episode functions without the learner's knowledge. Some may question how Python suddenly has a head function. You can point them to the code in their episode functions file. The joining across multiple tables on different column names can feel overwhelming and complex, especially the final episode. Be sure to check in with learners periodically and make sure that they are not spinning their wheels, possibly showing one of the steps to building the final query. Finally, this episode uses the European spelling of neighbors with a U. The final step we need to do before we have reproduced the results of figure one in Price, Whelan, and Banaka is to create a filter around the main sequence of GD1 in a G minus I color magnitude diagram. To do this, we read in the GD1 isochrone file, which was included in the student download directory. We then create a polygon around the main sequence and exploit matplotlib to create a mask that includes only stars in this polygon. We then apply that mask to the results from episode six to create a spatial plot of the GD1 stream with our final sample. This plot is shown on the right. This episode gives learners more experience with pandas and the HDF5 file format. Additionally, it shows them a matplotlib trick of creating a polygon and then using the contains method to select points inside that polygon. In this episode, we continue to save our intermediate results, ensuring that we can pick up our analysis at any point. Additionally, as everything we are doing is in a notebook, the steps of our analysis are recorded as well. Much of the complexity of this episode revolves around the isochrone, which is read from an external file that learners will have downloaded. If you are curious about how the isochrone was made, a description is linked to in the extras menu of the curriculum's website and in the episode itself. Like many episodes, it can be easy to get lost in the details of this one, especially in building the polygon around the main sequence. Make sure to zoom out frequently on what you are doing and why. Finally, a curious learner who reads the original paper may notice that we've simplified the selection of the region around the isochrone. You can assure them that this does not significantly alter our results. The final episode of this curriculum focuses on making a clear publication quality figure. It starts by asking learners to think about what makes a good figure then shows some tricks for customizing figures with matplotlib, and finally we get to make figure one from Price, Whelan, and Banaka. This is what our final figure will look like. The goal of this episode is to fill in matplotlib gaps for learners by highlighting annotations, patches, parameter customization, and creating multi-panel figures, all to facilitate the communication of results. We hope that this will help learners streamline the creation of informative and high quality figures. In addition to new tools, the power of writing our plotting functions in previous episodes is highlighted when we create each panel with a few lines of code. Episode eight emphasizes clear communication of scientific ideas by thinking about the story you want to tell and how to minimize the work for the reader through features like annotations. It also focuses on ways to override default matplotlib settings to minimize the work that you have to do for every figure. This episode is best taught with a lot of linking to matplotlib websites. You may find it useful to have learners use the link list under the extras menu of the curriculum website. Additionally, like episode seven, it includes an external file that was downloaded in the student download directory. And that's it for the curriculum. Now I want to spend a few minutes on broad advice for the whole workshop. First, think about how you will communicate exercises and links to learners. You will also want to decide beforehand whether you will do each day in a separate notebook or each episode. 
Starting a new notebook for each episode will take away some time from each section and how much time depends on your audience. It is also helpful to think about whether you want a communication channel that is exclusively used by instructors and helpers. This curriculum is dense and there is a lot of typing involved. For this reason, it can be overwhelming to both instructors and learners. Make sure you share the link to the curriculum with learners at the beginning of the workshop. Many have reported that it is useful to follow along. You can also point out to learners that each episode has a starting from this episode section of collapsible text that enables them to catch up if they get lost or need to sit back and take a breather. Both of these pieces of information can reassure learners. Another way to ease the typing load while maintaining the carpentry's emphasis on live coding is to copy and paste from a recent cell and then modify it. If doing this, it is important to be very slow and explicit about every step you take, especially the ones that are hidden from learners. Finally, consider a Slack channel or Etherpad into which a helper can type commands as you go. Learners have found this very helpful. Every episode in this workshop builds on previous episodes, making it challenging to see what can be skipped if you're running short on time. Here are a few recommendations of corners you can cut. By far the easiest place to make up time is in episode 8. Learners gain a lot from this episode just by seeing what is available, even if they don't get to play around with it. For this reason, you can conduct it as a show and tell, especially the exercises. Although less significant time-wise, the section on writing and reading in CSV files at the end of episode 6 is not important for the rest of the curriculum and could be skipped. Likewise, checking the size of the HDF5 file and the discussion about context managers in episode 4 can be skipped. Finally, I'd like to point you to our instructor guide, which contains much of the content of this onboarding in addition to a few points that could come up during the workshop. It can be found under Instructor Notes in the Extras menu of the curriculum website or by following this link. Thank you for watching. We're really excited to have you on board as an instructor for the Foundations of Astronomical Data Science curriculum.